Uh, everyone can hear me? All good? I'm quite loud anyway, so it should be fine. First of all, thanks for such a great turnout to the security dev room. Like, it's absolutely amazing to see this room completely packed with people, so awesome. Good job. Uh, so my name is Chris. Uh, I work at Facebook London as a security engineer. I'm the lead on a project called Sesto. It's essentially, uh, I was told by an Italian, that means basket in Italian. So for all your Italians out there, I'm sure it's a great name. Uh, so this is basically one system which handles SSL automation and monitoring at Facebook. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the modern best practices um, for running TLS, uh, both at scale and in general. Uh, mostly high level at the beginning, uh, mostly general procedural stuff, um, but I'll go into some low level tips at the end. Oh, and uh, I would usually say, feel free to interrupt me, this talk is like running right to the edge, so let's, uh, I'll answer all the questions at the end. Uh, so there's three sections. They might seem a little bit different, uh, but they all generally address the problem of problems you'll you'll have running SSL. Let's go. So uh, the 7th of April 2014 was kind of a special day for the world. <laughs> for, for, for some definition of the word special, and perhaps never before had so many system administrators said the word shit at the same time. Uh, so what made Heartbleed special? Well, it was one of the first open SSL vulnerabilities that could practically result in the disclosure of your private data. Uh, namely, user passwords, private keys, all of this was originally thought to be theoretical, and then it was shown to be actually very practical. And if, if some random uh, guy on the internet gets your private key, then you're completely messed up because they can pretend to be you to anyone. And if you don't support forward secrecy, they not only can pretend to be you to anyone, they can also go read all your previous communications, which is always fun. Um, so Hartley pretty much everybody on the known internet. Uh, everyone wants to get them rekeyed, revoked, re uh, put back out to their servers, and the CAs were simply not ready to cope with this. I'm sure any system administrator in the room who was, who was working at that time can attest, absolutely nothing was working that day. Like, literally, you couldn't get anything reissued. Um, because they were totally, totally reissued. And inside companies, people were having like a mental and physical panic and running around like everything's on fire. Um, so it was it was pretty chaotic all over the place. Basically, nobody was ready for this thing to happen. So the work done uh, inside companies using SSL is mostly what I'm going to cover today. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the challenges we had after the announcement, some of the steps we took to mitigate Heartbleed and attack stack it, uh, and some of the things we could have done better and, and we've learned from. So Facebook has many, many thousands of services, and I'm sorry to the people who who are on the small video who can't read what that says at the bottom right. Uh, working out which which services are actually uh, vulnerable is, is quite challenging. So this is not just like HTTPS. It's not like the only thing I serve in my day is, is Facebook.com. This is like MQTT over TLS for messaging. Uh, this is secure thrift for RPC between our services. This is SMTPS for like our corporate mail gateways and like forwarding out to the world. This kind of stuff is not easily enumerable within our infrastructure. So acquisitions have all their own infrastructure. Maybe we migrate them to our infrastructure eventually, but often they keep some of their infrastructure. Uh, there are things we have to store outside of our infrastructure for compliance reasons. There are microsites which are hosted, hosted on things like WordPress uh, or thir other third-party hosts because they don't need any access to our infrastructure. They're just like marketing sites. Um, there are so many different types of deployment that it's absolutely impossible to enumerate what is every single thing that we own that serves SSL. It's just impossible. Uh, there are some places to look for service kind of things. For example, we can look in our, ser uh, in our, in our, in our service deployments for stuff which links to, for example, OpenSSL. Uh, we can look in Chef to see what services are actually deployed to machines so you can see where you need to redeploy them. Uh, and we also did stuff like scanning the whole of our IP space uh, to try and work out what's going on. And, and I, I told you, we were in like a panic, right? It's like, we did like passive checking of all our data center traffic to try and see what's encrypted, how the hell can I get find out which certs needs doing it. This is very, very, very time consuming and not accurate. It's basically the thing you do with the last resort is in like an absolute panic. Um, so you, you need to make sure you have a better deployment strategy than that. I'll go more into the better way later, but let's just go over some of the some of the challenges for now. Uh, so even when you've worked out what services need uh, need to be fixed, uh, you probably don't know who can fix them at this point. You you might have some huge service, like Facebook has tons of huge services for the messaging stuff and for obviously like your news feed and stuff like that. Um, but identifying like smaller services which might be critical in their own way. Uh, 
is very, very difficult. They might not even have any documentation. They might not even have any uh, on-call rotation. They might have absolutely no information. The only thing you know is there is a service running on some machine, and I have no idea who the hell owns it. Uh, that's one of the one of the one of the best and worst things about working in a huge company is when you discover something is running in it. Nobody knows what it is, uh, or has asked it to run. Uh, it's kind of Skynet like. Um, so we also faced logistical challenges doing this kind of thing quickly. Uh, the start time is not far enough in the past. Like literally, I'll go. I'll say the statistic again. I'm sure because it's mind blowing. We did some preliminary statistics on Android, on our FE for Android app. 5% of users, if you don't set your, your uh, certificate to start uh, that far in the past, like one year in the past, will simply fail to connect to your service. That was our experience uh, on Android. This data is slightly skewed because of retransmits and stuff like that if you fail. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one problem. And the second one is we didn't have the right routes for pinning automatically when we went and asked our CA to go and reissue the certificate. Uh, they reissued it with a pin which we didn't have available, and yeah, then then that was very very bad. Uh, so it needed like manual intervention, which is which is awful. Um, and even today, like automation for special certs is is really very really not good around the web, and it needs to get better, and it is getting better with time. Uh, so some solutions. So when Harvey hit, um, Facebook was kind of in the wild west of certificate issuance. Uh, people bought, and mo I'm sure it's a very familiar story to lots of you. People bought and monitored their own certs, and like we didn't have a clear view of what we didn't know who was buying from what CAs, what the story was on their servers. It was really, really bad. Um, so we started to move towards uh, storing and issuing certs centrally uh, to get a clearer picture of the world. That way, you can enumerate them all super quickly. You don't have to go find all the endpoints that use them. You just have to store and issue them centrally and keep it up to date with the world. Um, so this drives down all the technical debt across the company because now you don't have tons of people implementing their own monitoring. Like some people had coded their own monitoring in the service, so you would see like some code which checks the certificate which you're serving. But like if you have to do that for every single service, it's a complete nightmare. Uh, and some teams had a more basic solution, which was to set like a calendar reminder on somebody's exchange calendar. Uh, and then when they left the company, that calendar reminder proceeded to absolutely fuck all. Um, <laughs> this general procedure is complete crap, right? Like, you, you have to have some way of enumerating them that doesn't, and, and like alerting on them that doesn't rely on every single team understanding how it still works. Because the reality is people, people don't understand how that works. You have to, you have, to have some, ex, some level of expertise in some team, and they have to help out. Um, so having them stored centrally does mean you can do things like enumerate certs which are vulnerable to certain types of uh, cert exploits based on their cert settings. Uh, look at stuff like uh, if they have a if they have a, a key which is uh, not forward secret, uh, and uh, generally like you can get them reissued and do things quickly. Uh, so nowadays certs are needed for every service. Uh, storing the point of contact, preferably in uncle rotation, is is very very important because you probably don't know who issued them. Um, you need to also get them pushed out of prog quick. If you store them centrally, you can, you can have a situation where you can have your deployment uh, routine uh, automated on the server, ready to go every single time. Uh, and you can also do automated monitoring of your certificate data there. Um, but you also have to make sure that that monitoring is kept up to date. Like if you store an on-call, uh, there's a person or a rotation, you have to make sure that on-call actually makes sense. It's not just some static string you store in your thing. It actually exists, and it has more than zero people in it. Um, because if you have zero people and it, it comes down to crunch time, then it's not going to be fun for you. Uh, so automation is really, really critical to rolling your certs and or donuts quickly. Uh, so you can have way more confidence in doing this super fast if you are already reissuing often already. So uh, pr uh, like I said before, when, when we reissued, we didn't realize we hadn't issued this certificate far enough in the past. We didn't realize that we had the wrong roots. Um, if you do this frequently, you will know exactly what should happen, and you will have some automated process which can deal with that for you. Um, you can also do things like uh, checking for lacking machines when your pool runs over. I mean, it kind of sucks if, if you have to reload your services. There are some services which just have to reload when you get new SSL credentials. Um, but uh, ideally, you should build your services in a way that you can reload the SSL and you don't have to restart like stuff and drain your entire pool, uh, because that kind of sucks. And you also need to know which services are under attack. Rollout takes time. You need to prioritize what you're going to roll out to. Somebody's stolen your RSA key or, or whatever, your EC key. Uh, you need to reissue, revoke, deploy right now to avoid 
uh, a man in the middle attack. Like it's it's just not feasible um, for you to wait on that kind of information, especially if there's a big site. Uh, also, you need to be able to quickly log suspicious requests. Uh, bearing in mind that you don't know what Suspicious looks like right now. If some if some attack like Heartbleed happens in the next five minutes, you don't know what it looks like right now. Nobody knew to look for SSL Heartbeats at the time that Heartbleed had, just before just before Heartbleed had occurred. You need to be able to push that out without a full code push, especially if you're in a company like Facebook where code pushing takes some time. We do it super regularly, we're very confident in it, it still takes time to push out hundreds of thousands of machines. Uh, so you need to build hooks into your infrastructure which can log the right things. Uh, you also need to monitor suspicious network requests for devices that can't do that themselves. Uh, as much as we hate these things in the security community, intrusion detection systems are pretty good for that. Uh, so two, monitor anything, everything. So in previous section we talked about uh, centralizing alerting. So the goals are basically to reduce tech debt and reduce duplicated work. Um, and doing it as, at a low, as much of a low level as possible seems to achieve these goals. So where can we get that low level? So it seems logical to do, uh, do it at the SSL vendor. Many of them provide notice of expiry. Uh, it seems a sensible place since the state of the world is there. But there are some lacking areas. Like they send you an email which says your certificate expires in 90 days, 60 days, 30 days, 7 days. Your certificate has expired, you're fucked. It's like that level. It's not something which you can deal with very, very well. Uh, you need to build like your own ownership, deduplication, like prioritization frameworks around all these emails. It's not very sustainable unless they have some API, um, which you can actually retrieve this information from, which I'll go back to later. Um, you also probably also want more types than just expiry alerting, which is the typical thing which the CA will give you. Um, you also want stuff like invariant violations, like uh, SHA-1 expiring after 2015, uh, known insecure attributes, uh, chain expiration, like uh, your key is not, it doesn't have enough bits. Uh, those kind of invariants are very important in Mono 2. Uh, and also you'll likely just generally use more than one CA eventually. Like you will have a company acquisition, you'll need it for a backup pin for like H, uh, HKP, uh, HPKP or some of those kind of pinning. Uh, and so this might not uh, actually match everything you think it does. Uh, okay, so we can't do it at the SSL vendor, so it seems logical to do it at the SSL terminator. So as long as you're only going to use ever one kind of termination software, totally fine. But as we know in most companies, you don't end up using one kind of SSL terminator. You have like a million different services and they all do their own crazy SSL stuff. Um, like I said earlier, we have some stuff on WordPress and stuff like that, so it never even is seen by our SSL terminator. Um, yeah, so realistically, uh, uh, for the long term, I don't think that's a good way of going. Or at least not a good sort of way of going. So if those aren't enough, then where should we do it? So there's no place where certificates naturally all exist together, usually. Uh, so you have to create one. And actually creating it is only half the problem. You need to keep it in sync with reality. So you need to request, issue, and deploy from there. You need to keep it naturally in sync with the whole place. If you don't do your operations from there, it's going to fall out of sync as soon as you start going. Uh, it's also easier to bake in like company-specific logic in your service that way. Like I told you, like on-call rotations, uh, deployment strategies, those things you can bake into that service. Uh, and also, this this is like a box inside your network, right? So you can do E2E -E testing of of your certificates. So it's possible to check that the cert that you think is on some service is actually on some service. And that's important uh, because there are lots of problems that can happen by you not communicating properly with everyone else what you think should be on their service. So each of these is good for different things. For example, only the SSL terminator can tell you what's going to use this, and only the SSL vendor can tell you what, actually, what the world actually looks like from their way. Um, so you need to work out your, your own requirements and go from there. So we alert at the termination and the certificate store levels. Uh, and in a pinch, I would definitely at least do the third store, because then you have more ideas about what's going on in your world. Uh, so this seems deceptively easy, right? Why, why is he telling us about how to monitor certificates? It's just some file. I can like, read it with OpenSSL. How does that work? Monitoring is super difficult for, for large organizations. Like These headlines are from the last year or two. And this one, the, the Instagram one, uh, I personally was responsible for this kind of thing. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and I can tell you for sure that headline is not accurate. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Oh, tech news sites are always accurate, you say. Uh, but, well, I hate to tell you, but you have been misled. Um, what actually happened in that case is uh, I renewed the certificate, I got it pushed out, and then I discovered actually there's a bunch of endpoints that I didn't know about when it got pushed out. So, 
you have to have some automated deployment. You have to understand like every way you're deploying to. Instagram is a complicated product. It has tons of endpoints. You can't just believe which in endpoints. Uh, you can't just imagine them in your head. Uh, you need to make sure you have end-to-end -end testing of every single asset which should have that. So. Uh, right now, regrettably, the software which we're developing at Facebook is not open source. It sucks. Uh, for solutions to SSL management, I highly recommend Lima by Netflix. Very, very smart people developing that. Um, it's very well engineered. If, if we hadn't already been writing this, I would totally use that. Um, it conforms pretty well to the best practices I just laid out. Uh, Let's Encrypt, also very awesome, free, open, automated CA by the ISRG. Uh, we're a gold sponsor, gotta get that out of the way. Uh, API is improving all the time. You can add to it, you can work with them on developing new open standards. And I said it's not worth developing stuff necessarily for, for CA integration, but their API is getting better all the time. So maybe it'll be true sometime. So, for the final thing, uh, so I talked about the high-level fundamental things to get right. Uh, now I want to talk more about the, the juicy low-level implementation we do. Um, so uh, EC, very, very awesome elliptic curve sets. We already had some talk, talk about it earlier. Um, so we saw 5% fewer machine clock cycles uh, and 30% fewer machine instructions when we switched from RSA to EC, which is amazing. That's like when you say I can save you 30% of like machine instructions to some Facebook engineer, they will like faint with with amazement. Uh, also, you get forward secrecy, very very important. Security security is just a function of time. Eventually, everything's going to be compromised, so you need to have forward secrecy um, so that people can be confident that your system is going to be uh, secure for the future. Uh, problems: EC chains not well trusted on old devices. ECDSA, ECDHE, those kind of things relatively new, the trust chain is not well distributed, um, so you can ask your CA to give you an EC cert uh, and then give you an intermediate, uh, which is an RSA intermediate, going to an RSA root. If so, get all the, all the awesome benefits of ECDSA key operations, like 30% improvement in performance, uh, but you also get the trust, uh, the, the trust on all devices. Awesome. Uh, so, CT logs. So, CT is certificate transparency. I'm sure some people in this room have, have seen this kind of stuff going with the Symantec stuff recently. Uh, it basically logs new certificate issuances by CAs. Uh, and it's useful for many things. It's useful for me, mm, uh, looking at domain misissuance. Uh, in the case of Symantec, misissuing google.com. Um, it's also useful for catching new phishing domains uh, that might use HTTPS to be, uh, appear legitimate. Um, for example, if somebody wanted to spoof Facebook, they might uh, also get the HTTPS certificate for some domain which is not Facebook, just to so appear legitimate. So it's kind of useful to find SSL issuances which are relevant to your interest, for whatever that may mean in your case. There are some limitations. Uh, only EV certs, uh, extended validation certs, are required to log to CT. Uh, that kind of sucks. Like those of, even we don't use EV that often. Um, many in the security community and I would like that to change. I personally would like every single every single member of the CAB forum to have to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, I'd like to see it, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so bear in mind, it's not comprehensive necessarily. We personally log all our issuances, as EV or not, to digital CT dog because we think that's the right thing to do. Uh, also, don't log your, don't leak your new shit in the process. If you have something called awesomenewproduct.com and you just got a certificate for, for it, yeah, that just became public information. So don't do that. Like, don't don't issue an SSL cert under your CT log in advance of some new product. That's probably a very bad plan. So don't buy coolnewproduct.com just yet. Uh, HPKP. Uh, so the thing which I can never say correctly at speed. Um, so it's a great way to stop a rogue CA, of which there have been many. Did you know Tar? Uh, and also you could argue like what Symantec did was the actions of something rogue. Um, it's a great way to stop a rogue CA from issuing stuff for your domain. So after the first load, it tells your browser to only accept a certain set of public keys, and one of those public keys must be in the chain which you serve. It can be the leaf, the intermediate, the root, it can be any of those, and they, those all have different kind of properties. So many people recommend chaining to the intermediate, uh, sorry, uh, recommend pinning to the intermediate, um, reason being then you can like issue uh, whatever, whenever your circuit's compromised, you can issue a new one from the same CA, great. Um, but we can do better than that. Like I would recommend pinning your leaf cert, which is the cert which is actually for your domain, um, and then going and putting in a safe some copy of some backup keys which you have with some CA. Um, otherwise, you you can just get compromised by your CA again. 
Um, there's also an awesome, awesome feature of this, which is you can also just do report only mode, um, which is like it will report chain val uh, chain validation errors to some URL of your choosing, uh, which is awesome for for like checking if some state is about to attack uh, your users. We're coming pretty close to the end, so I'm going to skip the next slide because it's it's basically the same thing. You can you can go to this URL at the bottom and see um, see all about it. It's basically HPKP, but not HPKP. Uh, so performance. So finally, performance has traditionally been a concern when adding TLS. There are some simple steps you can do to improve performance. Um, so one is handshake optimization. You can use TLS false start. Uh, TLS false start is being kind of an iffy thing, like browser support is kind of iffy right now. It was in Chrome, and it wasn't in Chrome, and all this stuff. Uh, it basically paralyzes the final part of the TLS handshake, and removes one, one trip, but the, yeah, so that, that, the browser support is iffy. Uh, one thing which is very, very awesome is TLS resumption and caching. I'm sure everyone in this room that runs a TLS deployment will run on some kind of TLS resumption and caching. Um, but you need to make sure you rotate your encryption keys, your ticket encryption keys. Uh, really, like uh, the number of websites we've seen which don't rotate their ticket encryption keys and like destroy any belief in forward secrecy is unbelievable. Uh, I will skip that. Uh, so the, for the final thing, using OC, OCSP stapling, you can avoid having your users look up OCSP records from the from your CA, uh, which can add like tons and tons of milliseconds to your handshake time. Uh, essentially, it, you have the CA sign your OCSP record, uh, and then you present it locally when you present the rest of the stuff to save time. Uh, Cloudflare, for example, reported 30% improvement in overall SSL setup time. 30% improvement in SSL setup time is amazing. Cool, so thanks for everyone who gave uh, feedback on this talk. Uh, this talk will be absolutely no one as good without their effort. And we now have maybe five minutes of questions, so I'll open the floor to questions, and thanks very much for listening. So the thing about HSTS is it's very, very awesome in the fact that it presents stuff like SSL script, uh, also things like that. We don't have it on all of our domains for a variety of really complicated reasons. The main reason being that we serve like HTTPS to almost everybody, like it's 99 point something percent. There is some subset of users which are just on such amazing crappy devices that you just can't possibly serve it. Um, we do have HSTS on as many domains as we can. Um, but yeah, my stance is awesome. If you can do it, then do it. Um, but like, as with everything in security, it's it's not a bind, right? You got to do the trade-off. Questions? When you think uh, the ACNIC protocol will be extended or used by the SSL vendors, what you think is the ACNIC protocol will be used by the SSL vendors? Oh, sure. I think if, if Let's Encrypt can, can validate itself as, like a, as a primary good quality CA, then I think everyone will be absolutely clamoring to take the network. Um, right, do I see that happening like immediately? No. The SSL community and the SSL vendors in general have so many regulations that just to do something Thing like this, there's a very time consuming process. Once we have seen the success of Let's Encrypt, we're already seeing that, uh, I think it will be a much more interesting proposition for them. Okay, so I have a question for you. Final one. What's up? What's up with SSL? What's up with SSL? Yeah. You want me to say TLS? Yeah, TLS. Uh, people don't. Well, I don't know. Are you from Microsoft? Is that why you want to say TLS? Uh, I don't know. Like, I feel like the whole SSL TLS thing is uh, just a long conversation. I don't know. Like, I, I say SSL because my, my general rule is if something applies to SSL and TLS, then I will just say SSL. Um, the reality is for this, I just want to simplify it. Like, this talk is not just being given here, it's also being given to other people who might not be as familiar with it. So I just want to say SSL, because everyone knows what that is, but TLS is like, yeah, I don't know. Thank you, Chris. Thanks.